explain to you the origins of this whole grandiose project of mine. Uh, it actually started out with a very um, uh, practical concern. Uh, after September 11, 2001, the United States uh, willy-nilly got uh, uh, involved in two uh, large wars in the Middle East uh, with the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. And it discovered that it was responsible for actually creating viable governments in both of these places where public authority had collapsed, uh, what uh, we in the United States call nation building, but which is actually more appropriately uh, labeled a process of state building. And I think that uh, the United States learned some very, very tough lessons in this. Uh, I was involved in a lot of debates on American foreign policy at that time. And one of the things I think that uh, the U.S. learned was that it didn't know the first thing about how to build a state. It had no idea. And in fact, the international community has been involved in these kinds of projects uh, quite intensively in many parts of the world, in Haiti, in Somalia, in the DRC, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, in many places where public authority has broken down. And I think that the overall experience uh, of the international community in doing these uh, uh, these interventions, uh, has been a very mixed one. There have been certain successes, but by and large, it's been very difficult to actually create viable, self-sustaining political institutions uh, in any of these troubled countries. And I think that part of the problem is the problem that I labeled in the book getting to Denmark, where Denmark it's in quotations. It's not the actual country Denmark. Denmark is just a mythical place that is democratic, well-governed, uh, very low levels of corruption, very prosperous, uh, a, a well-functioning society. And the issue is that what, we, what the international community keeps doing is going to places like Somalia and Haiti and trying to turn it into Denmark, some version of Denmark, because we have this idealized view of what a well-functioning uh, state ought to look like. But we never get there because we actually don't know how Denmark got to be Denmark. Now, I happen to know a certain amount about Denmark because I had a visiting professorship at the University of Aarhus for several years. And as a result of that interaction with a lot of uh, Danish people, I can tell you the Danes have no idea how they, they became Denmark. Uh, and, you know, the reason for this is that the actual process of institutional formation and building was a long, violent, and messy one. But in the case of let's say most European countries was one buried so far in the historical past that everybody's simply forgotten about how they got there. And therefore, when they confront the problem of, of, of building political institutions uh, in a contemporary, troubled, uh, developing country, uh, they actually haven't learned the, you know, they, 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 they've forgotten uh, the, the lessons of their own history. So I thought it might be a good idea to go back and actually figure out where these institutions uh, come from. And so, um, so let me. So I'm going to talk about different parts of the world, and it is going to be a little bit of an excursus in uh, in history. The British High Commissioner, who's honored us with our pres his presence today, said that he's a historian. And one thing I've discovered is actually uh, we need more historians because we actually know the history of uh, uh, of our own societies. I think very poorly. I'm going to start with some definitions because I think that's critical in understanding what political order consists of. When I talk about the development of political institutions, I'm talking about three distinct sets of institutions uh, that can be exist in different combinations uh, from one another, but are all critical to the functioning of a modern political system. The first institution is the state. The state was defined by the sociologist Max Weber as a legitimate monopoly of force over a defined territory. And I believe that this still remains the best and most useful definition of, a, of what a state is. A state is about power. It is about the ability to concentrate and use power and use that power to enforce rules and laws and rule over a particular territory, all right? A modern state is something different from a traditional or what Weber called a patrimonial state. 
A traditional state is basically an outgrowth of the ruler's family. It's part of the ruler's patrimony. That's why it's called patrimonial. So the ruler, in some sense, thinks of the, the government as his plaything, l'état c'est moi, great, the famous saying of Louis XIV. A modern state is a very different animal because a modern state seeks to be impersonal. That is to say, your relationship to the state does not depend on whether you are part of the friend, the circle of friends or family of the president or the prime minister. The state seeks to treat each citizen as an equal citizen with uh, theoretically equal access to that state. Modern states, and that transition from a patrimonial to a modern state, is probably the most difficult transition uh, in the process of political development. Uh, it's actually easier to transition into a democracy because we know pretty well how to stage an election. But what we understand a lot less well is how you make that transition uh, from essentially a very personalistic kind of state. Uh, in Africa, a lot of pl uh, political scientists use the term neo-patrimonial uh, to describe many states in this part of the world. How you make a transition from that kind of a state where your relationship to the state is determined by your closeness to the ruler to an impersonal one. All right? So that's the state. That's one set of institutions. Second set of institutions uh, have to do with the rule of law. Many definitions exist of the rule of law. It can be just law and order. Uh, in the West, we tend to think of the rule of law and identify it with a certain set of substantive legal norms regarding rights of minorities, gender rights, uh, 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 and, and the like. Uh, but I believe that politically, the most important definition of the rule of law is the following. The rule of law is a set of rules of justice that reflect the general consensus of the community as to what just rules are, but they have to be binding on the most powerful individuals in the society. If the president, the king, the prime minister can make up rules as he or she goes along, then it's not the rule of law. The rule of law, therefore, needs to be embodied in a separate set of institutions that can apply those rules and apply it against the people with the guns, basically, the people that are, are wielders of power. And finally, uh, you have institutions of accountability. Uh, I prefer to use the word accountability to the word democracy because I think accountability has a broader and a more substantive meaning. What accountability means is that the government should be oriented towards the good of the whole community and not just the private good uh, of, the, of, the, of the ruling elite or the ruler, all right? It, in, in modern political systems, we regard accountability, we associate accountability with a certain set of procedures, free and fair multi-party elections. Uh, but the procedural form of accountability doesn't always correspond to substantive accountability. That is to say, elections do not always produce governments that are truly responsive to the needs of their citizens, and it's possible that some authoritarian regimes are actually more responsive than, uh, than others uh, in, in, in doing that. So the goal uh, is really substantive accountability, but in the modern world, the way we achieve that is through uh, free and fair multi-party elections. All right, so if you think about these three institutions, the first of these, the state, is all about power and the concentration and the use of power. The second two are constraints on power. They ensure that power is used for public purposes in accordance with the law, reflecting the interests of the whole community. And so a liberal democracy, uh, which I think is a balanced regime that has all three of these components uh, in it is in a certain sense a kind of miracle. I mean, it's a miracle that it exists because you need a state that is powerful enough to actually do things that citizens want, to protect them, both domestically and from foreign enemies, to provide services, to provide uh, education, uh, health care, um, uh, and, 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 and to enforce rules, but it also needs to be constrained. So in a sense, you know, you think about President Obama, 
He's extremely powerful. He's got his hand on the nuclear trigger, but that hand is guided by, by law and by democratic norms and by democratic uh, uh, procedure. And so that's the general framework in which we have to think about political development. Now, uh, the first volume of my book actually begins with primates, <laughs> with the behavior of, of chimpanzees and a lot of other uh, pre-human uh, precursors to, to um, human societies. But the reason that it's necessary to go back that far is because human biology is actually important. Uh, human beings are not isolated, rational individuals like the economists would like you to believe. They are social animals from the get-go. They uh, live in society and they flourish and are happy only uh, in society. But human sociability, the kind of sociability that we have by nature, that our genetic endowments uh, give us, is a very specific sort. Uh, there are two biological principles, a principle of kin selection that the great uh, British biologist William Hamilton first outlined, which is basically a principle that says we are altruistic towards people that we are genetically related to in proportion to the number of genes that we share. It's basically a principle of nepotism. And the second is a principle called reciprocal altruism, which many non-human species exhibit, where you don't have to be a genetic relative, but you exchange favors on a face-to-face -face basis, and you develop mutually beneficial relationships based on that exchange of favors. These are the two natural forms of human sociability. No human child needs to be taught sociability in this sense. They will do this out on the playground, and they've got a whole suite of emotions that support this kind of social interaction. This is the kind of social interaction that is the default for the human species, and it's invariant across all human civilizations. So the early forms of human social organization are basically based on family and friends. And political orders grow out of the need, in a certain sense, to get beyond family and friends. And so I said, a modern state has to be impersonal. Treating citizens on an impersonal basis is very unnatural. You are naturally inclined to favor your relatives and people with whom you've exchanged favors. That's what patronage, political patronage, is all about. But a modern state gets beyond patronage and clientelism and phenomena of that sort and seeks to be impersonal in the way that it treats citizens. It hires officials based on their merit, based on their technical capacity, and not just whether they're the cousin of the president, right? And so, in a certain sense, a modern political order has got to be very unnatural. It's got to create incentives and institutions that override these natural forms of sociability. And the moment those institutions start to break down, we revert to friends and family, because that's what we are, that's, that's the way we're, we're used to interacting by nature. So I'm going to give you a very truncated historical tour uh, to describe to you where these three categories of institutions came from. Uh, how they evolved out of the natural sociability that, that characterizes pre-state society. So where did the state come from? There's a well-known sociologist, Charles Tilley, who passed away a few years ago, who was probably the chief theorist about state formation, at least in early modern Europe. And he had this very pithy uh, phrase, he said, the state makes war and war made the state. This was talking about early modern Europe, Europe in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. So how is it that you get to a state that uh, treats people impersonally, that gets beyond friends and family? And I think historically, uh, the driver of this has been military competition, not economic interaction, but military competition. In, in my book, uh, it really starts and, and spends a great deal of time on ancient China. Uh, this is to say China between the first millennium BC and about the, the third century BC. Because China, uh, I would argue, is not the first civilization that created a state, because there are many states in Egypt, in Mesopotamia, in Mexico, and other places, but China was the first civilization to create a modern sense in the sense of a state that was impersonal, bureaucratic, hierarchical, and could treat citizens in this impersonal fashion. And the way the Chinese got to it was exactly the way the Europeans were to get to it 1,800 years later through relentless military competition. So 
In the year, approximately the year 1000 BC, China was divided up into maybe 1,200 different small, basically tribal entities that fought each other continuously for about a 700 year period. Uh, by the 5th century, they had, had consolidated into maybe 25 entities. At the beginning of what the Chinese call their Warring States period, the number had fallen to seven. And in the year 223 BC, China was unified under the first national dynasty, the, the, the Qin dynasty, in which the western state of Qin defeated the other six Warring States and became the dominant uh, force in China. And at that point, China actually had a modern state. It had a modern state because it had to fight wars on a continuous basis. It used to be that wars were fought by aristocrats riding chariots, but they discovered that mass peasant armies, infantry armies, were more effective than could beat a chariot army. But in order to conscript peasants, you had to have resources. You had to have uh, resources to pay for them. In order to re have resources, you had to tax. In order to tax, you had to have a civilian bureaucracy. You had to have a logistics supply train. Uh, and therefore, you had to have a government. And furthermore, the Chinese discovered very early on that if you hired your cousin as a general, you're going to lose battles. If you choose your cousin rather than the, the most competent general, you're going to lose battles, and you and your entire lineage are going to get killed. And so that's a pretty powerful incentive for meritocracy. And so the first civil service examination in the world was actually done in China in the 3rd century BC, and this is the beginning of a very long Chinese tradition of state centralization. So for the next 2300 years, the default condition of China is to build a strong, centralized, bureaucratic, modern, impersonal state. That's what they were good at two millennia ago, and under the current Chinese Communist Party, that is still what they are good at. All right? And what drove them to this was this history of relentless military competition. What the Chinese didn't achieve were the other two components. And, and by the way, so when I give them credit for creating the first modern state and doing it 1,800 years before any European did, that's only a half-hearted compliment because the Chinese never developed the other two uh, political institutions, they never developed a rule of law, and they never developed democratic accountability until you get to, let's say, the, the Republic of China on Taiwan in the 20th century. And so what the Chinese did, in essence, by creating this very powerful centralized bureaucratic state, is they created a proto-totalitarian dictatorship. You know, so the Chinese tradition is one of state dictatorship that is unchecked by law and unchecked by democratic uh, 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 means of accountability. Now, why did the Chinese not have law, uh, which gets into the second institution, which is the rule of law, uh, and that has a very different origin. Chinese didn't have law because in China there's never been a transcendental religion. Rule of law, where it exists, has always come out of an independent religious tradition that provided the initial body of law, provided the jurists and the judges and the lawyers and the interpreters of that law, and that that law constituted a break on political power. This was true in ancient Israel. It is true in the Christian West. It is true under uh, Islam, and it is true in Hindu India. In India, for example, the famous, the Varnas, the caste system, put the Brahmins on top. The, the, the Brahmins are the, the, the top Varna. The Brahmins are priests. They are interpreters of the Vedic texts. The second cast down from the Brahmins are the Kshatriyas, who are the warriors. These are the guys with weapons. These are the people that yield uh, power, and in the Indian tradition, it is absolutely clear that the Brahmin is, is the superior, has a superior authority. So the Raja, the king, has to go to the Brahmin to get sanctification. Otherwise, his rule is not legitimate. And so that's an example of the law limiting political power. Similarly, in Islam, in many cases, the Sultan and the Caliph the secular and the religious authority were vested in the same person, but in many periods of, of Islamic history, they were different people. And so the caliphate, the, the, the um, um, 
the ulama, the, 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 the jurists that interpreted Sharia uh, were a separate institution that could pass judgment on the behavior of people with political power. But the law gets developed the most fully and institutionalized the most fully uh, in, uh, in Europe. And this happens a very long time ago in a conflict that nobody remembers in contemporary Europe that took place in the 11th century. So in that period in European history, priests and bishops in the Catholic Church could marry and they were appointed by the Holy Roman Emperor or by a local prince and they were thoroughly enmeshed in the corrupt local politics of the European petty princes of that period. There was a great pope, Pope Gregory VII, who led a papal party and he said the church is not going to exert moral authority unless, first of all, we clean up our own act. And so he pushed for celibacy of the priesthood. A lot of modern Catholics think that somehow this is a biblical injunction. It's not. <laughs> it's not. It was, it was actually a, a practical measure to prevent nepotism within the church because a lot of priests and bishops would get a benefice and they'd, try, they'd have children and they'd then want to pass the benefice. They'd scheme their whole lives to figure out how to give that benefits to their children. So the papal party said, we're not going to stop this unless we uh, make the priesthood celibate. And then he said, we're not going to be truly independent unless we have the right to appoint our own priests and bishops. We have to take that away from the secular authorities. And so this leads to a prolonged conflict with the Holy Roman Emperor, who at that time was a fellow named Henry IV, uh, known as the investiture conflict. Uh, Gregory VII um, excommunicated uh, Henry. He had to go and seek absolution uh, at uh, Canossa, barefoot in the snow. That didn't stop him from then fighting the papal forces. And finally, at the end of about two generations of conflict, the church won its ability to uh, appoint its own priests and bishops. And at the same time, they unearthed a document uh, known as the Justinian Code from a library in northern Italy. They started teaching this uh, body of Roman law, this highly codified body of Roman law, in a very famous law school in Bologna, Italy, which then seated law schools in Paris and Copenhagen and Warsaw, Oxford, and other places. And the European legal tradition, the civil law tradition, really starts uh, at this point. It is the church that sets up the independent judicial authority that eventually evolves into an independent judiciary. Now, England has a separate common law tradition that runs a little bit differently, but that tradition of independent judges is every bit as independent of political power uh, as is the uh, system in Europe. So this is what's peculiar about European development. Europeans got to a modern state very late. You didn't have a modern state in Europe. You didn't have a Chinese-style state in Europe until really the 17th, 18th centuries when Sweden and France uh, begin to create and Prussia begin to create this kind of state. Centuries before that, you had this very deep tradition of law, and it meant that state building in Europe was constrained by law from the beginning. The Germ you know, Germany didn't unify until 1871, in large part because there are all these legal uh, rights that were held by these German princes, and the German states spent all this time litigating against one another until Bismarck said, okay, the hell with this, we're just going to use force and unify everybody. Uh, and so there's a very, very deeply embedded tradition uh, in, in Europe uh, of uh, law. It comes way before the state, and it comes, of course, way before democracy. Where does democracy itself come from? Uh, accountable government. That is also a, a kind of historical accident. Uh, it has to do with the survival of a feudal institution into the modern era that evolves eventually into modern parliaments. So at the end of the Middle Ages, every European country has something called the estates. These are representatives of the elites in the country, the clergy, the nobility, uh, sometimes the bourgeoisie. Uh, they're represented in a formal assembly, and under feudal law, the king has to go to them to get taxes. All right? 
So beginning in the late 16th century, a lot of European monarchs decide that they're going to behave like Chinese emperors and start to accumulate centralized power and get the right to tax their subjects directly without having to go to the estates. And this sets off a whole series of prolonged wars and struggles within every European country against the Cortes and the Spanish king, between the Diet and the, the Polish and the Hungarian kings, um, uh, between the, the, the Russian Tsar and the Ziemski Soviet. Sobor, right? If there's only one country in which this conflict, uh, in a sense, gets stalemated because the parliamentary side, well, back up a little bit, in most countries in Europe, the king wins, the state wins, so the, the, the centralizing authority defeats the estate. So this happens in France, it happens in Spain, it happens in Russia, all right? It happens in Prussia. But only in one country is the parliamentary side strong enough to fight the king to a standstill, and that country is England. So in the early 17th century, they actually fight a civil war. The king loses that civil war. They cut his head off. There's a Republican period for a while that doesn't work so well. They restore the king. That king threatens to become a Catholic, or is a Catholic, threatens to take the country back into Catholicism. The Protestant parliament doesn't like that. They bring in a new king from Holland, uh, King William, that establishes a new dynasty under something called the Glorious Revolution, which is the first constitutional settlement that establishes the principle of uh, parliamentary accountability. No taxation without representation. This is the battle cry of the parliamentary side in the English Civil War, and that is the principle that gets established as a result of the constitutional settlement in 1688 uh, known as the Glorious Revolution. Now, this is a very important precedent because less than 100 years later in North America, the British colonies don't like the authority of the English king, King George III, and they stage a revolt. And in 1776, Thomas Jefferson pens the Declaration of Independence that is based on the writings of the philosopher John Locke. John Locke, by the way, lived in Leiden and came over in the same ship with Queen Mary when, when the dynasty of William and Mary was, was first established. And John Locke writes the second treatise on government in which he says that legitimate government uh, comes, legitimate obedience derives from consent of the people. If you don't have the consent of the people, you're not a legitimate government, and you have the right to revolt against the state uh, if, if they don't have your consent. All right? 1776, all of this comes together in this new American republic that is established, and what are the two rallying cries of the American colonists? Legitimacy based on consent of the governed, no taxation without representation. And this is really the founding principle of American democracy that then gets codified in a constitutional system uh, because it protects property rights uh, so well. It leads to a capitalist market economy that then industrializes, grows, becomes an extremely powerful uh, political and economic system. Uh, and in many ways, the world that we know today is shaped by this combination of political and in economic institutions, but in particular, this balance between state, rule of law, and accountable government uh, is a formula that gets discovered in this period, and that is the one that I think is still the dominant uh, form of legitimate government uh, today. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to now bring this story forward because we spent enough time in history. Uh, and I do want to talk, uh, since we're here in Nairobi, I do want to talk about uh, Africa, which, as I said, uh, is a subject of quite a few chapters in the second volume of this book. Uh, the second volume takes the story forward from the French Revolution and the beginning of industrialization in Europe and so forth, and essentially uh, tries to explain how we get to modern government and also the question of how we de deteriorate, because political decay, I think, is also part of the story. No political institution lasts forever. With regard to 
African political institutions, uh, and, and in, in a certain sense, um, Africa and East Asia are at other at opposite ends of the spectrum. And I think that a lot of the development outcomes in contemporary Africa actually have to do with the pre-modern institutional inheritance that um, uh, existed well before colonialism, but then colonialism as a further layer of, of complication to this. So Africa is a region prior to the introduction of European influence, you know, first with the uh, Portuguese and so forth in the, in the 15th, 16th centuries. Uh, Africa, uh, only about half of Africa lives under state-level institutions. Uh, there are very many parts of Africa that um, are still tribally organized as virtually every other part of the world was uh, at various uh, points in history. Uh, and of those state structures, the you know, Zulu Kingdom in, in southern, uh, you know, in Natal, uh, or the, the um, Borno or the Caliphate of Sokoto, uh, these were, I would say, traditional state-level institutions, but not of the same level that the Chinese uh, achieved in terms of creating modern, centralized, impersonal uh, state-level institutions. This is the kind of Africa that existed when the European colonialists got to it. Now, <laughs> I, I know that this is a huge field of study, and it's one that's invested with a great deal of emotion, and um, it's one that I can address in, in a way only very superficially. The colonial inheritance that the Europeans left was a very complicated one, uh, and you know, there's a lot of studies, for example, that show that there is a direct uh, linkage between the European slave trade and the practice of slavery in West Africa, you know, in Nigeria and Benin and Gold, uh, um, and, and, and uh, uh, Gold Coast places, well, Benin, uh, places of that sort, Togo, uh, and uh, the existence of authoritarian political structures uh, in the present. And I think, you know, that stands to reason that you create a highly extractive, dictatorial, uh, form of economic exploitation and it has uh, political consequences. But I think that there's also a very important colonial legacy that was also in a way equally destructive, uh, which had to do with the nature of colonialism. So in Latin America, Spanish and Portuguese went there for the gold and silver. They went there for economic resources. They wanted to exploit it. They took the gold and silver out. They enslaved and killed off the local population. And that left that region with a highly unequal and very hierarchical uh, political tradition. In Africa, the British and French and Germans and everybody else were hoping to find uh, gold and silver and, and resources. They found them in certain places. So they found them in southern Africa, they found them in, in, in the Congo, but by and large they discovered after, uh, and, and first, furthermore the colonialism really didn't get into high gear until the 1890s, after the Berlin uh, conference in the late 1880s, and they found that a lot of their colonial territories actually didn't return enough in terms of resources to even pay for their own uh, administration. And so the British uh, uh, began a policy known as indirect rule, uh, whereby they realized that they were not going to turn uh, Nigeria or Kenya or other colonial possessions uh, into some version of Britain. They were not going to behave as they did in Hong Kong and Singapore where they actually set up British style uh, crown colonies, uh, but they were going to try to adapt to local conditions. But you know what indirect rule was, was basically colonialism on the cheap. Uh, that they would main, maintain sovereignty uh, over these areas, but not have to pay for their upkeep, and they would do this by trying to maintain what they regarded as traditional African institutions. The problem with indirect rule is that already at this point, Africa was beginning to be half modernized, and the, and the you know the whole field of anthropology, in a sense, uh, uh, people like E. Evans Pritchard and Charles Meek were hired by the British colonial authorities to try to understand what. Uh, what they called customary uh, uh, law and tradition uh, were all about so that they could rule uh, Africa uh, in this fashion. Uh, and actually a lot of 
important early anthropological studies were funded by these British colonial uh, authorities. But they screwed up this process. And they screwed up this process because they did not accurately understand the nature of true indigenous uh, traditions. And in places where they wanted to preserve that traditional rule, uh, what they did was actually freeze uh, you know, certain areas in time and actually deny Africans the uh, ability to modernize. And so today, you know, indirect rule was actually created in northern Nigeria, uh, in the caliphates in northern Nigeria by Sir Frederick Lugard, who was the, the British commissioner in that region uh, in the first decade of the, of the 20th century. And if you look at northern Nigeria today, it's the, it's the poorest part of, of Nigeria. It's the poorest part of Nigeria because the British really left it under a traditional leadership, but not a dynamic one, one that had been frozen in time, as opposed to uh, the rule in the south that was actually much more open to uh, social change and political change. Uh, And so I would say that a lot of the inheritance uh, was... You know, in, in some areas like the Belgian Congo, it was exploitative and dictatorial. In other areas, it was a sin of omission. Colonial authorities never found it worth their while to create uh, the equivalent of the Indian uh, higher uh, administrative service or the Indian army or other powerful colonial institutions uh, that would be transferred to newly independent governments and would be the institutional basis for states as these former colonies went into independence. And so I think that it is state weakness that is the dominant uh, um, you know, institutional um, uh, deficit that uh, many African countries faced. And so you have this complicated situation right now. Uh, and, and by the way, when I talk about state weakness, you have to understand that I'm talking about a state in, in, in this modern definition of the term because there's a difference between uh, what is sometimes referred to as a despotic state, a state that's able to repress its enemies to you know, jail journalists and put opposition figures in, in, in prison, and a state that can actually deliver services that, uh, in, in the words of the sociologist Michael Mann, that exercises infrastructural power, that can build roads and hospitals, put school children, uh, uh, you know, educate school children and the like. And so the institutional deficit was not in that despotic state because there's been plenty of despotism uh, in Africa. The, the real deficit was in that infrastructure state uh, that was able to provide uh, those basic services. Uh, and so the institutional mix in Africa right now is, uh, is a complex one. Uh, I think that it's done really well in the last um, uh, 20 years. Uh, the Africa rising story, I think, is, is basically a correct one because there are many countries like Kenya that actually have implemented uh, this combination of state, rule of law, and um, uh, and, and democratic accountability, and have done reasonably well and have grown economically as uh, as a result of that. But there is still a deficit in stateness. There is still a deficit uh, in the ability of states to deliver basic public services to their citizens. And this then affects the quality of democracy. And by the way, this is not a problem that is unique to Africa. I think that many uh, countries making a transition to democracy have had exactly this problem. So right now in Kiev, in Ukraine, there's protesters out in the street uh, protesting the Yanukovych government. They had an opportunity to govern uh, at the time of the Orange Revolution in 2004 when the same President Yanukovych was um, uh, was replaced by uh, the Orange Coalition. And if you look at the history of Ukraine in that period, and why is it that democracy didn't do better uh, at that great window of opportunity, it is basically because the Democrats, the people that wanted an end to this old kleptocratic uh, dictatorship, didn't know how to govern. They didn't know how to clean up corruption on their own, uh, among their own allies. They didn't know how to make the state deliver economic growth, uh, impartial justice, uh, and a number of other things. And as a result, they lost the next election, and they are in the, the situation that they're in right now. So. This, in a certain sense, is, um, I think, the challenge for political development at the moment. 
we have countries with different mixtures of these three institutions and they tend to get imbalanced. China continues to have an extremely strong bureaucratic, pretty competent state. It does not have enough constraint on that state. It needs rule of law. It needs democratic accountability because it can act strongly and decisively in many situations, but it can also and does daily violate the rights of its citizens. So it has high levels of uh, corruption because, again, there is no democratic accountability for corrupt uh, officials in China. The United States, I would say, is at the opposite end of that spectrum. We have a not terribly effective state in many ways, despite you know, a good deal of state modernization. What we Americans really like is constraining the state. So we've got a system of checks and balances that last, uh, uh, last fall produced a shutdown of the entire American government because Congress couldn't agree with uh, President Obama on a budget. You know, Congress hasn't passed a budget in uh, three years <laughs> uh, uh, because of this system. And I think in the developing world, uh, one of the great deficits it continues to be the deficit of, of exactly the state that I was talking about, not the despotic state that's able to uh, suppress and tyrannize, but an impersonal state that is able to deliver services uh, to citizens on an impersonal basis that has the basic state capacity uh, to regulate, uh, to provide security uh, over a defined territory. Uh, and the like. And I think that the political development challenge uh, is both improving all of the institutions in all three of those categories, but also watching uh, for the balance. And I think nobody gets it right. Now, I mentioned that uh, in my forthcoming book, I've got a section on um, uh, political decay because I think that. Um, one of the characteristics of any political order uh, is the susceptibility to decay. Uh, and decay comes about for really two reasons. First is just the stickiness of institutions. Human beings uh, become emotionally invested in a certain set of institutional arrangements. And many times when those the conditions that led to the original formation of those institutions change, the, the institutions fail to adapt. So that's one source of decay. The other one has to do with vested interests, that elites in any society use their superior access to the political system uh, to protect their interests. So over time, you get this slow accumulation of, uh, uh, or, or the state gets captured uh, by elites in a slow accumulation of very powerful vested interests. And I think that in many um, developed democracies, including uh, our American democracy, or my American democracy, uh, this, you know, you can see evidence of this uh, process uh, unfolding. So I guess the thought I would leave you with is that both the process of political development and the process of avoiding political decay are ongoing ones. I think that there is a model out there that is a good one, which is the model of balance between the three institutions. But no country, in a sense, hits that balance correctly. And even if a country hits that balance correctly in a certain historical period, it does not mean that it's going to keep that balance uh, into the future. And that's, I think, the you know, the challenge that uh, lies uh, before all of us. So uh, I have, actually, I can say a lot more. Uh, for example, I think that the historical story I told you about China and India carries forward into the present uh, and is reflected in the nature of contemporary Chinese and Indian government. Uh, if you want to hear about that, I welcome you to ask me uh, in the question and answer period, but uh, I think for now I'm going to stop speaking and, and we'll open the floor up to uh, uh, questions from the audience. Thank you very much.